Welcome to our section on securities markets and transactions. In the first video of this section, I'll introduce the basic definition of a market, discuss primary and secondary markets, and then give you a background on why firms undertake IPOs. Then in our second video, I'll discuss the primary and secondary markets for securities as well as important legislation and regulations. I'll also discuss market microstructure and innovations in trading. Finally, in the third part of this section, I'll cover margin trading, short sales, and international stock trading. Let's get started. When we talk about markets, what we're referring to is a regular gathering of people for the purchase or sale of provisions, livestock, and other assets. Markets can take many forms, such as a direct search market, where buyers and sellers seek each other out, a brokered market, where brokers buy and sell securities on behalf of their clients. We can also have dealer markets, where dealers maintain inventory of assets from which they buy and sell. And we can also have auction markets, where traders converge at one place to trade. The primary market, or market for newly issued stocks and bonds, is often a brokered market. The creation and issuance, which is collectively known as underwriting, of new securities is usually handled by investment banks. The goal of the primary market is to raise capital for a firm or government in exchange for an issuance of stock or bonds or some other security. Secondary markets are the markets where existing securities are traded between investors. The New York Stock Exchange is a perfect example of a secondary market. Shares of stocks like Ford and GM have already been issued to the public and those investors can sell their shares to other investors via the exchange. Typically, investors trade securities via a broker like Scott Trade, E-Trade, or Fidelity. Bonds also trade on exchanges. Now let's talk about how firms raise capital in the primary market. There are several securities private firms can issue to raise capital or cash. The first is via a private placement. This involves the firm issuing either shares of stock directly to individuals or institutional investors. The firm can be selective about who it issues shares and bonds to. The next option for raising capital is via a public offering. If this is the first time the firm has issued shares to the public, it's known as an initial public offering or IPO. If the firm's shares are already trading on a public stock exchange, this would be considered a secondary equity offering or SEO. The last way that firms often raise new capital via a stock issuance is through what's called a rights offering. In this case, the firm allows current shareholders the opportunity to buy shares proportionate to their ownership of the firm's total shares. For example, if Berkshire Hathaway owns 5% of the shares outstanding of Coca-Cola, and Coca-Cola wants to raise $100 million via a rights offering, the firm will allow Berkshire Hathaway to purchase up to 5% or $5 million worth of the new shares. Firms can also raise shares via a debt issuance or bank loans. When a firm receives a bank loan, this is often from one or several commercial banks or other financial institutions. Firms can also receive a revolving line of credit, aka a revolver, which allows them to borrow up to a certain amount as long as the firm pays off their line of credit at least once every so often. Usually it's every few months or every year. Firms that issue bonds can issue them privately or to the public. Now let's talk about the stages of capital raising for firms in the U.S. Initial funding is called the seed funding. Seed funding is used to develop a prototype product which usually sells in small quantities. Once the firm has exhausted its ability to raise capital from its initial investors, like the founder, it's time to reach out to angel investors and venture capital firms. Angel investors are high net worth individuals like the sharks on Shark Tank. These individuals are individuals who make investments in new or de novo firms. Venture capital firms are firms that pool assets and invest in private companies with the intention of taking those firms public or selling out at a later date to some acquirer. A firm might receive multiple rounds of funding from angel investors and VC firms or venture capital firms before finally undertaking an IPO or being acquired. In the US, the largest firms are publicly traded, meaning they've already undertaken an IPO. Private firms are much smaller in sales of total revenue. This is because it's more difficult to raise capital for new capital budgeting projects from a, a limited number of individuals. In the U.S., 
privately held firms are restricted to a maximum of 499 shareholders. This can make it difficult to raise capital beyond a certain point. However, mutual funds that own shares only count as one shareholder. The big problem with owning shares of private firms is that these shares are very illiquid. As we discussed earlier in class, liquidity is defined as the ability to buy or sell an asset quickly for close to its fair value. If you want to sell shares of a privately held firm, you often have to sell your shares to one of the other current shareholders. If no one wants to buy these shares at the price you want to sell them at, you often have to sell your shares at a discount. One big benefit that private firms have versus publicly traded firms is that they have fewer reporting obligations. For example, I only reported the sales revenue for the firms on the previous slide because we don't know what the total assets or total debt of privately held firms like Cargill or Albertsons are. There are several benefits of converting from a privately held firm to a publicly traded firm. First, the IPO process will make international news and get people who haven't done business with the firm more interested in the firm's products. For example, when I found out that Beyond Meat was undertaking an IPO, I decided to try one of the firm's burgers. In case you're wondering, it was pretty good. The second benefit of an IPO is that the firm receives much needed capital. Firms can raise a large amount of capital via an IPO. When Saudi Aramco undertook its IPO, it raised $25.6 billion. This was the largest IPO in history, but it illustrates the sheer amount of cash that can be raised by going public. Public firms can also issue secondary equity offerings, or SEOs, to raise additional cash. The third big benefit of undertaking an IPO is that the initial shareholders of the firm, the ones who own shares when the firm was private, can sell their shares and liquidate their position. Usually they have to wait six months for the firm's lockup expiration to end. Selling shares after the lockup expiration date is one of the primary ways that venture capital firms and angel investors profit from their investment in a private company. The final benefit of going public is that firms must submit regular paperwork to the SEC much of which is made public via the SEC's Edgar website. While this might seem like a drawback, the increased transparency often incentivizes firm management to behave themselves. The decrease in information asymmetry from firm documents being made public also increases the value of the firm's shares. Why? Well, since this new information provides potential shareholders greater information about the firm's operations, it makes it easier for these potential investors to determine whether the shares they're purchasing are worth the investment. A decrease in risk for these shareholders means that they're willing to pay more for these shares. So let's recap. We talked about the primary market. And the primary market is the market for new securities, whereas the secondary market is where those securities trade across investors. Next, we talked about how firms raise capital. And they raise capital by issuing many different types of securities, equity, debt, preferred stock, etc. Next, I talked about how equity can be issued using an IPO, a secondary equity offering, or a rights offering. Finally, we talked about why IPOs make sense for large firms. In many cases, the shareholders of those private firms want to cash out, and one of the best ways to cash out is to take the firm public and allow the firm to sell its shares to new investors. All right, with that, I'm going to wrap up, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, and I will see you on the next video.